disregarding for the moment the premise of an absolute value for zero we can begin with the number square comprised of the first integer sum squared such that one times one equals one thus the one cell is a simple single square containing the absolute value of one however even this concept is considered trivial in discussing the natural substance of number squares because of the differentiation of the second integer between number squares and word squares such that at two times two equals four no sums satisfy the definition of a magic number square that it be able to produce a magic sum or magic constant consisting of the same sum recurring when adding up along rows columns or diagonals certain integer amounts listed within each of the square sums cells however a magic square with only four cells can be useful as a magic word square by containing any sum up to four letters in any arrangement confer yadhe vadhe or isis the distinction of magic number squares from magic word squares becomes greater at the integer unit per side of three cells by three cells squared of nine cells total there is only one single solitary magic number square of base three all others possible for base three magic number squares being merely derivations of this original by rotation or reflection if one approaches the base three type of squaring using a method of columns and rows in which the same symbols do not repeat the result is as shown here using the alchemical logos for salt sulfur and mercury to hold the place of number sums as symbolic variables instead a set of six such possible symbol-based non-repeating rearrangements into a magic square type pattern in other words there are six squares of nine cells each and in each cell is a symbol that occurs only once per row and once per column within the context of each of those six base three squares thus from any three symbolic variables the maximum sum of this type of magic squares producible is six likewise when we substitute symbolic variables for integer amounts inside the base cells for each magic square patterns arising between these rearrangements also begin to become clear these same patterns underlie both the symbolic value and the magic sum forms of magic square and comprise a kind of innate current of causation on the surface of which revolve and rotate the variables in each cell accordingly there are 880 unique magic sum squares possible for a square of four cells per side however when dealing in terms of symbolic variables rather than integer amounts the total of all possible magic squares is different just as it was in the case of the base three squares while there are 880 different possible magic sum squares there are only eight possible recombinations without repetition for symbolic variable squares and again if we were to constrain these symbolic variable squares to different parameters such that rather than not repeating in either row or column any of the given symbolic variables may repeat as often as the number of cells per square the total of all possible such magic squares generated would be a different amount again this time being 48 such 4 by 4 squares instead of only eight when constrained to non-repeating column and row rules or 880 when given an infinite set of integer amounts per cell rather than a limited set of symbolic variables the final pattern we will examine in this introduction is the base 5 or 5 by 5 cell square 
when using integer amounts inside these cells to create magic sum or magic constant number squares, there are 275,305,224 possible base 5 magic squares. On the other hand, using symbolic variables from a base 5 set thereof, in place of these integer amounts, inside the base 5 magic squares cells, the resultant total of all possible magic squares of this type is 10. It should be worth noting as well, again, that the total for all possible magic squares of a non-repeating column and row type using symbolic variables is the same for any set of symbolic variables the same number base as the number of cells per side of each magic square. For example, the five ESP testing symbols may be used, or the five platonic solids, but in both cases the same exact total possible magic squares form with the same exact typical patterns of submerged causality stirring their surfaces. So we see that there are various different kinds of magic squares, from the purely mathematical, yielding a magic constant from numerical amounts per cell, to the symbolic variety of which differing total possible magic squares can exist by applying different rules for the variables per cell, and finally the word square or magic square comprised of only letters, which can in turn be of a legible, intelligible type, or enciphered apparently at random. Of all these kinds of magic squares, by far the predominantly prevalent in real human history has been the gematria or alphanumeric type, produced by substituting letters from any given syllabary for the numerical amounts per cell in a mathematical magic square, thus carrying over the trait of the purely numerical version that it may produce a magic constant, in turn also equivalent to a letter or combination of letters, and so on. The first and therefore oldest number square is, it may be reasoned, also the simplest in form However, the base 3 number square seems to have originated in two separate locations more or less simultaneously, at a point in history around some 4,000 years ago. In what is now modern China, a wise sage, son of a gun and founder of the Jia dynasty, Emperor Yu, in his younger days, mythically discovered the original number square etched into the shell of a turtle. This discovery assisted you in rerouting the Yellow or He and the Luo or Lo rivers east. The second comes to us in a contemporary though much more degraded superstition involving amulets and talismans related to the seven classical planets of antiquity from the earliest Babylonians of the Levant again circa 1830 to 1817 BC. It appears this tradition preceded the reign of Hammurabi over a newly unified Babylonian Empire and was already a well accepted custom of the area by the era of his rulership from 1810 to 1750 BC. King Kang of Zhu from around 1020 to 978 BC supposedly first put the Ho Ti, or Yellow River map, basis for the Bagua, eight trigrams of the I Ching, on public display, and this dates the probable discovery of the accompanying Lo Shu number square to prior to this time period as well. Traditionally, the Lo Shu number square, also called the Nine Halls diagram, is said to have been discovered by Yu the Great, circa 2200 to 2101 BC, a prehistoric emperor of China, 
It was this you who succeeded King Shun by royal appointment, even superseding Shun's son in praise for his massive public works program, creating irrigation canals, relieving floodwaters into mainland fields from well-dredged and sometimes rerouted riverbeds. Emperor Yu supposedly, in turn, received the low shoe magic square from marks he saw once imprinted onto the shell of a turtle. The low shoe magic square is usually expressed in unary, base one, dots of either black, symbolizing yin, the masculine active influence, or white, symbolizing yang, the feminine passive influence, and each of these, except the centralmost numerical amount, the integer 5, is associated with one of the eight trigrams of the I Ching Bagua. However, there are two differing arrangements relating these eight trigrams to the Lo Shu Square's nine numbered cells. The relationships between the trigrams are represented in the two differing arrangements called the Primordial Earlier Heaven, or Fu Shi Bagua, and the Manifested Later Heaven, or King Wen Bagua. In the Earlier Heaven arrangement, the trigrams proceed thus around clockwise from heaven at the top, next to wind, next water, next mountain, and at the nadir point, earth, followed ascending leftward by thunder, then fire, and finally lake, before returning once more to heaven at the apex. In the later heaven arrangement, the trigrams, following the same concourse from the apex clockwise, begin with fire, following to earth, following to lake, following to heaven, with the element water at the base, following next to mountain, then to thunder, and finally to wind, before returning again to fire at the top. Although related to the Ho Ti, or Yellow River map, and to the Lo Shu number squares early and later heaven arrangements variously in the past, the present preferred relation of the Lo Shu magic number square to the Bagua trigrams is, as shown here, with the sums proceeding clockwise from the top around the central cell, which is labeled by the integer 5, 9 at the peak, related to the trigram for fire, followed by 2, related to earth, followed by 7, related to lake, followed by 6, related to heaven, with 1 at the base or nadir, relating there to the trigram for water, following next to 8, relating to mountain, then next to three, related to thunder, and last to four, relative to wind. But despite all these complex implications, the Lo Shu magic number square is only one of the two original mathematical puzzles posited as emanating from this era. The other format, called the Yellow River Map, or Ho Ti, was supposedly instrumental in the partitioning out of the nine regions of post-diluvial China when Emperor Yu rerouted the primary mainland rivers, the Lo and the He, east toward the Pacific. Although the standard depiction of the Ho Ti diagram is in unary, or base one dots and dashes symbolizing numerical amounts, it may also be depicted, as shown here on the left, as a circular array or motif, essentially comprised of the same elements, only in this model with these traits all being warped about a circle rather than, as shown here on the right, a square pattern. While the low shoe number square places its attributes usually nowadays in alignment with the later heaven array of the Bagua trigrams, the Ho T diagram tends to be more often associated with the early heaven array, which may be telling as to the order of their origins and relationship around that time to one another. Here we can see the trigrams arranged around the Ho T diagram in the early heaven array. 
a manner that may or may not modernize the notion of the low shoe magic number square involves comparing and contrasting the ancient low shoe array with the standard arrangement of these same nine sums on a digital dialing pad. The manner of comparison in this model, however, cannot rightly be the additive technique usually used to derive a magic number sum or magic number constant from the integers inside the cells of the magic squares, that is, by adding up the rows, columns, and diagonals to arrive at an identical sum in all cases. The modern, standard array is not a traditional magic number square in this sense. However, comparison between the low shoe and the standard array using a multiplicative rather than additive technique remains useful. The Levantine tradition of wearing amulets and talismans to ward off the evil eye and other such common social curses is likely as old as the earliest development of jewelry at the first proto-city settlements like Neville Cory, dating to probably some 11,000 years ago. There is no particular reason to assume, however, that these early forms of Chaldean region talisman shown here, the so-called camia, or positions in the zodiac, originated anywhere in or near Neville Cory itself per se, nor even necessarily at such an early time period. Nevertheless, it is known the Semitic Bedouins of the Arabian region remained continuously informed of these sort of sigils and laymans through to the publication of the Encyclopedia of the Brethren of Purity, Razael Ikwan al-Safa, circa 983 A.D., which featured the first now known of depictions of magic number squares of orders base 5, consisting of 25 cells, and base 6, consisting of 36 cells. Probably the earliest depictions of a set of seven attributes that was used in talismanic magic was the cameo positions of the zodiac, illustrations, or ideograms. These appear ancient, and their origin remains unknown. It continues to be likely they date back to at least some time prior to the era of Hammurabi's reign over Babylon, circa 1810 to 1750 BC. However, this seemingly simplistic and even primitive format for collecting a set of seven symbolic variables, arbitrary in appearance, becomes far more complicated when we begin to examine the other accompanying logograms that are attached with the camia. What we are looking at here is the origin for the Chaldean order of the ultimately so-called planetary camia. Here we see the camia positions in the zodiac listed along the rightmost columns on both left and right pages as well as apparently resonant geometrical designs associated with seven planets along the leftmost column of both pages, with, between these left and right columns, sigils attributed to the spirit and the demon of each planetary influence. Also note in this display, there are sigils within the laymans of the camia positions on the zodiac. These inner sigils are called by the names of seven archangels, and the outer camia positions on the zodiac are related to the days of the week. In this tablet from Francis Barrett's 1801 work, The Magus, we see only the extrapolated sigils within the camia and laymans, arranged in a horizontal row and related by way of vertical columns to the days of the week at the top the names of the archangels next down, the sigils themselves in the chart's midst, the signs of the zodiac round governed over by each of the seven classical planets known to antiquity, and below this, the names of seven heavens, one associated with each. This depicts the ultimate extension of what has since come to be known as the 
Chaldean arrangement for these attributes. So we see that, in so-called old world reasoning, the right ordering, by orbital circumference, of the seven planets of antiquity was subservient to the naming of the seven days of the calendrical week. Therefore, the order by day of the week is given here, and not by the so-called magical order that was truer to actual observable data, only with the sun and moon's locations reversed. Nevertheless, both these directions of looking at the symbolic variables here, by the order of days of the week and by the magical order of the planets alike, constitute the original ordering for the Chaldean arrangement of the cosmos because they relate to one another diagrammatically in the context of a heptagon containing a heptagram star. When the days of the week are placed as reading around the circumference of the heptagon, the magic order of the planets will be spelt out by the connections made from one point to the next along the interior unicursal heptagram. Likewise, when the ruling planets are placed into magical order around the heptagon, the days of the week will arise as the interconnecting points along the heptagram star, as shown here. So we see the Chaldean arrangement of these symbolic variables relates certain archangels to certain cameo positions in the zodiac, and from thence relates these pairs to certain days of the week and ruling planets over signs of the zodiac round. For example, here we see that Sunday, the first day of the week, relates to the zodiac round sign Leo. Monday, the second day of the week, to the zodiac round sign Cancer, and so on and so forth, such that all the rest of the ruling planets govern over two signs of the zodiac round apiece, Mars over Aries and Scorpio, Mercury over Gemini and Virgo, and etc. In this diagram are given the seven cameo positions in the zodiac, containing within them the sigil marks of the seven archangels, who correspond with the seven days of the week, and these correspond with the seven planets known in antiquity, and these each rule one or two signs of the ecliptic zodiac round. Also given are the names of the spirit and demon whose sigils were given on a preceding page. For each of these columns of alignment between the other traits of the cameo, the archangels, the planets, and signs on the zodiac round. Also given are the Hebrew gematria values for each of these names. Note that it is the demon of the sun relating the cameo Ach and the archangel Michael to the zodiac round sign Leo, named Sorath, whose name's gematria totals 666, but that the magic number constant of the solar number square of 6 times 6 equals 36 is 111. The culmination of the Chaldean arrangement is a diagram for the zodiac round that is based on the rulership of planets over the signs deriving from the rulership of the archangels over the cameo, or positions in the zodiac. Just so, in this diagram, we see a standard zodiac round, or a circle divided into twelve equal parts, being crossed by five horizontal and one vertical dividers, such that each division across the circle's face pairs two signs on opposite sides of the zodiac round circumference. The archangels and planets of antiquity govern these seven subdivisions of the circle's face, and the cameo and zodiac round govern the twelve subdivisions of the circle's circumference. Now, to put this all into a more recognizable perspective, here is a key for deciphering all the rest into the most modern terms available, those being from the around 2,500-year-old school of astrology, where we can see, quite simply, the ruling planets in red 
and the signs of the zodiac round in black. Just as each planetary ruler corresponds to one of the seven zones across the zodiac round circular face, and thus to one or two signs on the zodiac round circumference, so too does each planet have its own corresponding number sum squared, and thus its own corresponding magic number square. For example, Saturn is the magic number square of three times three cells per side, Jupiter the magic number square of four squared cells, etc., etc. But, to continue to converse in the common vernacular of astrology, the sun sign, assigned to each house, roughly one month each, on the zodiac round, is not the same anymore as the rising sign, or the actual constellation of the ecliptic zodiac round that is rising over Earth's eastern horizon at any given time of the year, because of polar precession, or the wander of Earth's rotational axis. As Earth has shifted its weight around, so to speak, over time it has lagged behind some small duration that has, gradually, amounted to nearly an entire extra month between the actual rising sign and the predicted sun sign. The result of this is that an accurate calendar of the solar eons, if it were to be founded on a depiction of the zodiac round of our own ecliptic, would have to be recalibrated to correspond to the present rising sign, rather than the anciently calibrated sun sign. The result of this recalibration is this model, which I call Pythagorean Year Zero. The final model exemplary of the Chaldean arrangement is this celestial sphere, calibrated to Pythagorean year zero, such that the sun aligns now to Gemini instead of Leo, the moon to Cancer, and etc., color-coded to the seven planetary rulers, forming a dome of seven stripes above and below the circumference of the equatorial zodiac round. Following the advent of the Phoenician alphabet, a 22-letter abjad that split from Egyptian hieroglyphics sometime between 1850 and 1550 BC, although by then still considered a proto-Sinatic or proto-Canaanite script by modern scholars, and the derivation from this Phoenician alphabet of the Greek, Old Hebrew, and ultimately Aramaic the use of gematria became widespread across the Late Bronze Age and Early Iron Age Levant. In cryptographic terms, gematria is simply a letter-for-number and number-for-letter substitution cipher. In its most basic method of explanation, Aleph, the Hebrew letter A, is 1, and Beth, the Hebrew letter B, is 2, etc., and so forth. Early Phoenician was a compact alphabet of 22 consonant letters, and this sum of cryptographic symbols was heavily influential on the thought processes of ancient world minds. Suffice it to say, for the purposes of our exposition here, that magic word squares and magic number squares can be considered, from this point on, identical. While the so-called Chaldean arrangement, placing a complex alphabet of logogram symbolic variables onto a simple base 7 lattice framework, may have appeared alien and irrelevant insofar as it harkens back to a primordial time period, as this ancient superstitious system flourished in a post-imperial era, it blossomed forth seven simple magic number squares and these, associated to the Kamiya, have become known as the seven planetary Kamiya magic number squares. Again, thanks to post-Phoenician gematria, each magic number square's integer amounts per cell could be translated into letters, and thus each of these seven magic number squares could be made into a word square also. 
the assignation to these magic gematria squares of the seven antiquarian planets and thus their association to the traditional cameo of the Chaldean arrangement may have been a later merger, possibly as recently as between 2,500 to 2,000 years ago, long following their initially developing independently from one another. However, the affiliation between these early magic gematria squares and the planetary rulers of the Chaldean arrangement and hence the cameo places in the zodiac laymans, etc., cannot be denied to have predated the lifetime of Yeshu, called the Christ. However, these fragments of a long-lost pre-Christian tradition have only been handed down to modernity in the form of certain medieval and modern translations of grimoires. So, in short, there are seven magic number squares, one for each iteration from cell sides of base 3 to cell sides of base 9, and inside each cell of these is an integer amount that can be translated into Phoenician, Greek, or Hebrew letters, which can, in turn, be translated into our modern Etruscan Latin alphabet. Here we see the final agreement in attribution of the planetary ruler to each magic number square, such that 3 squared equals Saturn, 4 squared equals Jupiter, 5 squared equals Mars, 6 squared equals the Sun, 7 squared equals Venus, 8 squared equals Mercury, and 9 squared equals the Moon. The fact that these attributions apply to the base cells per square means that Besides only these given examples, any other magic number square with the same sum base cells per square could be assigned that planetary ruler attribute as well. So any 4x4 four four square can be assigned to Jupiter, 5x5 five five to Mars, etc. This fact becomes particularly relevant when we return to considering the nature and substance of magic squares. There are resonance patterns created in causality by the confinement to exact size scale parameters, or in perhaps more polite terms, because a square can be measured as containing nine cells due to having four sides each equally divisible into three that square will transmit certain patterns of cause and effect onto any medium introduced on top of it. And likewise with a square divisible into 16 unit cells, being 4x4 four four cells per side, a square of 25 cells, being 5x5 five five units per side, and so on and so forth. These patterns arise as a mathematically inherent result from the constriction and size scale to certain ratios of these square shapes. Again, a 3x3 three three magic number square will not act quite the same as a 4x4 four four square, which will, in turn, signify a different pattern on its surface from the 5x5 five five square, and etc. These patterns affect the relationships between the integer amounts per cell to one another. With all this in mind, let us next pause to consider the, possibly counterintuitive, contribution of Pythagoras via Euclid's 47th problem to the history of magic number squares. If we begin by looking at the Pythagorean theorem triangle, given in Euclid's 47th proposition, we find it is a right triangle with leg lengths 3 and 4 and hypotenuse of length 5, surrounded by the squares of each side's length, such that a 3x3 three three equals 9 cell square, a 4x4 four four equals 16 cell square, and a 5x5 five five 25 cell square, surround the outline of the Pythagorean triangle. Now, because these lengths form a ratio that cannot be replicated using the same size base unit continuously throughout, 
A variable size for the unit cell per square allows us to visually bend the Pythagorean theorem by making it apply to squares with side lengths other than only those usually applicable. For example, the 3-4-5 triple angle is a properly Pythagorean theorem right triangle, as is a right triangle with legs length 5 and 12 and a hypotenuse of length 13. However, in standard Euclidean geometry, in Cartesian plane space, a Pythagorean right triangle with leg lengths 4 and 5 and hypotenuse of length 6, or with legs of 5 and 6 and a hypotenuse of 7, would not be possible. But for the sake of artistic shorthand, we may alter the base unit size per cell in each different square just enough to preserve this ratio of expansion illusorily throughout an entire sequence of arithmetically unfolding magic number squares. When we begin to examine the seven planetary camia magic number squares along this Pythagorean triangle rate of expanding base unit size scale, we first begin with the Hebrew alphabetic cipher using letters in place of integer amounts to construct an ancient magic word square. Here we can see the seven smallest size scale magic number squares arranged according to this Pythagorean array and labeled with the Hebrew letters that have been associated with these magic number squares for at least two millennia. Next, let us look at the integer amounts that these Hebrew letters translate to using gematria. Here we can see the entire array may be flipped left counterclockwise or right clockwise and thus has an additional layer of meaning in that regard as well. However, mere reflection aside, any given square based on cells per side while within this Pythagorean configuration will be equal to any other of equal cells per side. This holds true regardless of the unit cell's contents, be they letters, numbers, or even symbolic variables. This is, again, because of the constraints to their interior substance placed upon each square by the geometric nature of its size scale. A base 3 magic number square will exhibit an underlying resonant causal pattern unique from a base 4, and so forth. The base 4 will be distinct from the base 5, and so forth and so on. So the innate causality patterns function within each magic number square, somewhat like how a Cladney surface works. A Cladney surface, named it for Ernst Cladney, is a surface such as a flat square sheet of metal onto which sand may be strewn and through which a pitched tonal frequency may be induced. The result of this yields a variety of different sound shape type patterns depending on the shape of the surface, the pitch and tone, etc. However, unlike Cladney patterns, formed when studying the standing waveform states of sound in sand by vibrating a metal surface, these causality patterns appear to be purely mathematically imposed and purely geometrically defined. However, if we peel back the next layer down to expose what force influences these resonant geometric patterns, as they in turn so greatly influence the relationships of the integer amounts per cell spilled across these squares like so much sand, we will only be exposing the mnemonic nature of squares. On this sub-substratum, we find an array of number squares beginning on the right with the number square of absolute zero, following with the number square of one, two, three, and etc. up to the largest square in the sequence being base six. 
In this sequence, we may clearly see how each smaller scale may nest in the center of the next iteration upward in size. This is the effect that warps the substance of each number square due to the geometric nature of its size scale. If, in this context, letters rest on top of numbers, and these in turn follow resonant geometric patterns of relationships themselves governed in turn by gnomonic properties innate in all squares, and these gnomons may best be labeled by symbolic variables, such as the three alchemical elements, the four terrestrial elements, the five ESP testing symbols, and etc., then we should assemble the hierarchy of orders for the layering of influence and force within these magic squares as such. At the uppermost, shallowest surface, letters. Beneath this, integer amounts, or number sums. Below these, the geometric resonant patterns in themselves. And below even these, on the smallest layer we can study here, the layer of gnomons, labeled only by symbolic variables. In the final iteration of this kind we will be studying here, we see squares from base 0 to base 9, color-coded according to a repeating 7-color spectrum scale, and demonstrating the unexpected trait of gnomons to be central in odd-numbered and off-central in even-numbered cells per side unit-based squares. From independent origins and a later merger with the base 7 planetary cameo system, the magic number square system of 7 squares with areas 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, and 81 respectively, of superstitious amulet and talisman making, has emerged as the predominant model for magic craftsmanship among the intelligentsia and Renaissance men. Entering the Dark Ages of European history, we find all this knowledge had been suppressed into grimoires. Allegedly referring to the diagnosis of all artists as Melancholia Imaginativa by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa from Agrippa's 1526 declamation attacking the uncertainty and vanity of the sciences and the arts, the 1514 engraving by German Renaissance master Albrecht Dürer titled Melancholia I is considered an enigmatic masterpiece to this day. It contains two anomalous subjects for art and another aspect unique to it out of all of Durer's works. Firstly, unlike all the rest of Durer's works, Melancholia contains its own written title. Secondly, unique to this work, is the object of uncertain geometrical proportions that has come to be called Durer's shape, comprised of at least two pentagonal and at least one triangular sides. And thirdly, the 4x4 four four or 16 cell Jupiter magic number square in the upper right corner of the composition. Novel features of Durer's magic number square include that the bottom row's central two cells contain the integer amounts 15 and 14, which appear to correspond to the date, 1514 AD, of its composition, despite this being prior to the Gregorian calendrical reforms. Another, purely mathematical, oddity of this example of a 4x4 four four square is that it has a magical sum, or constant, that recurs multiply throughout it, such that this square's magic sum of 34 is arrived at not only by the usual addition per row, column, and diagonals, but also occurs as the sum of the four corner cells, the sum of the middle four cells, and the sum of each of the four cells per quadrant of the square. If Durer did base this artwork on the written works of Agrippa, 
then Durer would not have been unfamiliar with Agrippa's other publication, Three Books Concerning Occult Philosophy, published between 1531 and 1533, which included the seven planetary cameo magic number squares as derived from the Hebrew. That Agrippa did not himself personally invent these talismans should be, by now, without doubt. However, even though the premise until now has been that the Chaldean arrangement included the seven planetary camia number squares from an antiquarian date, it is not entirely impossible that Agrippa, writing in the 1500s and having been schooled under master cryptographer Johann Trithemius, was aware of the Alberti cipher disk proposed by Leon Battista Alberti in his 1467 treatise De Cifris. Both the planetary cameo number squares given in Agrippa and the Alberti cipher disk bear distinct resemblances to methods of encryption by then long in use by Hebrew Kabbalist scholars. Although the work on Hebrew Kabbalah called the Sefer Yetzirah was attributed to the first prophet of God, Abraham. It was originally referenced in the first century AD by Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanania, a student both of Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, 47 BC to 73 AD, the leader of all Jewry after the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, and of Rabbi Nahunia ben Hakana leader of the school that wrote Sefer HaBahir, another important early work on HaKabalah. In the fourth verse of the second chapter of the Sefer Yetzirah, it references placing the 22 foundation letters into a circle to create a wall with 231 gates. When any 22 points are arranged in a circle, Exactly 231 lines can be drawn across the circle's face to connect each one to every other. Because there are 231 connections between every foundation letter and every other, there are also 231 letter pairs or two-letter words formed in this manner, excluding repetition and consideration of order. This arrangement of 231 words of two letters each can be plotted as a chart with 22 rows and 22 columns that is only half full. In Kabbalah, this is called the logical method for deriving these 231 words of two letters each. Another method for deriving these results is called the Kabbalistic method and involves employing the Albam cipher to create a scrambled arrangement of the results. Both the Albam cipher and the resultant Kabbalistic method arrangement of the 231 gate two-letter words are encryption methods used by Hebrew Kabbalists prior to the invention of the Vignier cipher in 1553 AD based on the 1564 cipher of Giovanni Battista Beloso using the auto-key cipher method of Giolarmo Cardano, 1501-1576. Although the earliest method of encryption yet recognized in Western civilization may be the Caesar cipher, developed by Julius Caesar, 100-44 BC. If the Sefer Yetzirah was authentically authored by the patriarch Abraham, then it harkens back to a much earlier and a much more sophisticated knowledge of cryptography among the ancient Hebrews. It is known, for example, that Rabbi Eliezer of Worms, 1176-1238 A.D., worked on the 231 gates using the Kabbalistic method to produce a series of 22 tables each containing 231 letters, and that his method was replicated and modified in the work Ima Kamalek, published in 1563. 
These tables constitute the earliest now known of examples of a magic gematria cube. However, they are certainly neither the last nor most complex of their kind. Dating from extant manuscripts copied down as early as 1608 AD, the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage internally dates its own origins to 1458, describing the lifetime of Abraham of Worms, who supposedly lived from 1362 to circa 1458. The exact authorship of the work remains disputed, although George Dane, co-author with Stephen Guth, of the more complete English translation published version, proposes it may authentically date to the lifetime, if not actually be from the hand of, Rabbi Yaakov Moylan, 1365-1427. The English translation editions available in print publication now include the work by Dan and Guth, which derived from, as mentioned, a more complete manuscript of the work obtained from Holland, as well as the earliest English translation edition by S. L. McGregor Mathers that derived from a fragmentary and incomplete manuscript found in the French library arsenal. Tracing from the private collection of the Marquis de Paulny, 1722-1787, and obtained from thence by the Comte d'Artois in 1785. Mather's manuscript is handwritten noted as being added to the catalog in 1883. The most fully complete and technically accurate edition, rechecked by comparison between extant manuscripts, etc., available now is in the works of Aaron Leach. The contents of the Book of Abramelin are somewhat similar to the standard medieval grimoire genre, but lack the usual section defining ritual magic as a form of natural philosophy. The historical section, then, describes the travels of Abraham of Worms, his 1409 meeting with the Egyptian mage Abramelin, and how Abraham is now imparting the knowledge this magus taught him to his own younger son, Lamech. The second portion of the work gives the standard prayers and practices for using this work as a practical system of ritual magic. The third portion of the work lists by name and rank a hierarchy of devils and demons, similar to the Lesser Key of King Solomon grimoire, called the Goetia, but with a larger total, 328 compared to 72, of such beings, including four princes, eight sub-princes, and 316 subservient spirits. The fourth section gives a collection of around 250 magic word squares. Mather's translation provides a fifth section, attempting to translate, where possible, these magic word squares into their linguistic origins. A variety of novel differences among these magic word squares occur between the various translations. For example, in Mather's work, there are 242 total squares, using a total of only 21 Latin letters, excluding J, W, X, Y, and Z, arranged into seven orders or types. Based on size scale, there are 106 base 5 squares, 71 base 7, 30 base 6, 11 base 8, 10 of base 4, 9 of base 9, and 1 of base 12. However, in Aaron Leitch's work, based on comparison between Mathers, Dean, and Guth, there are 255 squares using a total of only 20 Latin letters, excluding J, Q, V, W, X, Y, and Z, arranged into eight orders, these being 94 base 5 squares, 86 base 7, 
34 base 6, 18 base 9, 11 base 8, 9 base 4, 1 base 11, and 1 base 12. Although these differences may seem trivial in the grand scheme of all things being considered, they serve to demonstrate the function and purpose of this present lecture's entire line of reasoning, a medieval era grimoire that uses multiple magic number squares stacked up by order to form certain sizes of magic number cube that can, when all related, be considered a form of magic number hypercube. Whether there are, for example, seven cell base orders, as in Mathers, or eight, as in Leach, and whether 20, as in Leach, or 21, as in Mathers, letters are used, thus become more significant questions when we realize that not only is each magic square of the same order related to every other, and thus each cell's letters all related as well, but so is each order related to the other orders in a meta pattern. And, moreover, the Book of Abramelin, folio of magic word squares, is not even the only grimoire of this kind from that time. In 1994, two manuscripts were found in the British Library, Sloan Manuscript 8, and the Bodleian Library, Bodleian Manuscript 908, under the title Alderea Siva Soiga Vokor by scholar Deborah Harkness. The Bodley 908 manuscript consists of 197 pages in four sections, including Liber Alderea, 95 pages, Liber Radiorum, 65 pages, and Liber Decima Septimus, 2 pages as well as a number of shorter and unnamed works, totaling approximately 10 pages. The final 18 pages of the manuscript contain 36 tables of letters. The Sloan 8 manuscript consists of 147 pages, mostly identical to the Bodley manuscript, with the exception that the 36 tables of letters each appear on a separate page, and that Liber Radiorum is presented in only a two-page summarization. In this work, otherwise unknown magical treatises are cited, including works called Liber E, Liber Os, Liber Dignus, Liber Cepal, Cepal being lapis, spelled backwards, and Liber Munob, Latin bonum, backward. The title itself, Soiga, is Agios, Greek for holy, in reverse. Again, the nature of the 36 apparently randomly selected letter tables featured in the Book of Soiga is that of a solid magic number cube. However, the intended use and function for such an object remains unknown, and its identification as such remains counterintuitive because the presence of such a model appears anachronistic to that time period. Although the Book of Soiga's origins are not exactly certain, it is well recognized and accepted that it was, during his lifetime, in the possession of Dr. John D., 1527-1609 A.D., Elizabethan era British mage and scholar. John D. himself was a highly skilled cryptographer, responsible for leaving to history the Enochian system of theurgic ritual magic, the most complex system for such yet produced, and which remains, to this day, unencrypted from its popular format into any otherwise meaningful structure. Among D.'s still undeciphered materials is included this work, a very large, base 49, or 2,401 cells, chart containing both Latin letters and Arabic numeral sums, arranged in a standard magic square diagram of cells in rows and columns, with a large circle accentuating and surrounding the centralmost pattern of the motif. 
At the core of this diagram is a magic word acrostic. That is, an incomplete magic word square arranging the five letters B, O, R, N, and G among some of the cells of a base 7, 49 cell square area. This square is surrounded by sequences of the numbers 1 through 7 and a variety of other letters, all apparently contextually meaningless and randomly selected. Another extremely mysterious leaf from Dee's personal handwritten folios is this, also apparently a very large magic square, containing apparently randomly selected letters, occurring only as diagonals in every other cell per row and column, except in four, base seven, subsquares, where letters have been filled into these cell spaces, otherwise left blank. John Dee is most famous nowadays for his Enochian magic system work. This consists of two separate systems, both making vast use of magic word squares, and these are the Heptarchical Bonorum of base 7, which created 49 squares of 49 letters each, and the system of the 30 heirs, the 4 watchtowers, and the 91 sigil places in the earth. The 30 heirs can be seen as 30 concentric spheres, each layer nested with the next, each above cradling each below, and so forth. The 91 places on the earth are given as 92 sigils on the four watchtower magic word square laymans of 12 by 13 cells apiece. The manner these relate to one another is that each seven-letter sigil occupies one of the 30 heirs such that there are 30 sigils per each heir and four for the lowest, centralmost core heir called Tex. The result yields a magic word square comprised of all four watchtowers combined around a black cross where the entire framework of 624 cells total serves as a layman upon which all these 92 Base 7 sigils are arranged. Basing his methods on the assignation to the skeletal framework with 156 cells per watchtower of symbolic variables by late 19th century Magus S. L. McGregor Mathers, early 20th century occultist Aleister Crowley proposed using color coding to make the meanings and relationships of the cells to one another appear clearer, as well as organizing the four watchtowers upright at right angles to each other all around a tablet of union to form a cubical altar. The similarity of Crowley's Enochian altar to the hypercube of Hakovala, based on the Gra version of the Tree of Life diagram, should also not be overlooked. This double cubic structure is likely the earliest tangible excursion of human mathematicians into the realm of hyperspace physics and, comprised of 10 exposed faces and 20 edges, constitutes the oldest now known model of a tesseract, or a single cube raised into the extra dimension we measure as time. If each of the seven planetary camia, magic gematria squares, can be said to have, at least, six possible elemental levels of meaning, such as Hebrew and Etruscan Latin letters, numbers and symbolic variables, resonant patterns and gnomons, or, that is, to have six possible different angles from which it may be looked at, which is to say, six sides, then each of these seven planetary camia magic gematria squares may be looked at as a cube. If these seven are each thus rendered into six-sided cubes, they may be so according to either the usual model with a fixed cell size throughout, 
or the Pythagorean variable cell size model, and thus can manifest two distinct size scale ratio sets. However, by either manner of determining their volume relative to one another, these cubes are innately designed to be able to fit the smaller base sum into the larger base sum, forming a hypercube with seven distinct levels or layers.